Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm just gonna do a click through of a really great product, a really great monster manual. Um, it's the Monster Overhaul uh, by Skirples. Um, really just an incredible book to have if you if you are using more OSR, really if you're using even 5e, you can use these principles and a lot of these, uh, these ideas in here, but especially if you're doing an OSR style campaign or um, even if you just kind of want a book that gives you, I don't know, random ideas about lots and lots of traditional monsters, some non-traditional ones, but mostly traditional ones. This is a great tool. Um, now I'm just gonna be clicking through. I don't have a physical copy of this one. I just have a PDF of it, but I, I thought I might click through at least some of it just to give you a sense of what this thing is like, because this is, I think, one of the best beast series out there. Um, and when it when Skirfles calls it a practical beast series, it really is. It absolutely is. This is the inside cover. You have um, the pages for a lot of these ideas, but let I me mean, look at the kind of information you're gonna get in this book. So it's a breakdown of the chapters, but the chapter's also a D20 table <laughs> and, and the page number that it's on. Popular monsters, uh, again, a D20 table, but also what their kind of average hit dice are and where you can find them in the book. Goblins, kobolds, skeletons, etc. You have a 2D6 reaction roll, but it's really, really useful. It's better than a regular reaction roll because you have feral reactions, general reactions, grandiose reactions, and unusual reactions. And you can choose which of those, you can have 2D6 and a D4, or you can just pick what kind of creature you're dealing with. Is this a feral creature? Is this a general kind of creature? Is this a grandiose creature? Or is it an unusual creature? All right. And so you can kind of give it... Um, these different so 2d6, but really you have four options for each 2d6 that you roll. And then you have reasons for an encounter, which is kind of um, beyond just simple reaction. This is if you're creating a, a, a random encounter table, perhaps, and you want different entries on that table. So you want to roll for a, a, a kind of creature, but then you also want to roll for maybe a particular element of the encounter. Um, reasons why this encounter is wandering around or something like that, or complications, right? Uh, if you check out uh, uh, Baron de Rop, uh, Dungeon Master, uh, you know, um, oh my gosh, I forget what his channel is called, but uh, um, Baron de Rop's encounter table videos, um, you'll see that he has, he talks about doing like three columns, right? Where one where you have the creature, one where you have the, um, the, the, the behavior of that creature, and then one column for a... Uh, you know, complication. And you could use these for, uh, for those tables as well. Um, now, the detail where they find you, it's kind of an interesting, maybe you, you do this as a start of a campaign or something. You might be able to do that, right? Where they find you. Um, you could also easily turn this around, though, where you find them, right? You could easily turn it around into that. But if you wanted to start a campaign, you needed a bit of an idea, an adventure of where to begin, you just roll on this, and that's where the campaign begins or something like that. On the other page, you have elements, vices, and virtues. Uh, local attitudes to whatever, right? That this is the local attitude that's going on and uh, the creature, or rather, you know, what the local attitude towards this creature is and what it's valued for in the area. Um, a unique feature on this particular creature and the texture for it. Um, I think that's just really, really cool. Uh, you get two chapter headings, one on the left and one on the right. I'm not sure exactly why, but you do have it in two places. And then you have, you know, horrible aesthetics and enigmatic variants. So again, if you want to make this particular creature slightly different than others of its kind, you can give it one of these extra traits. And then below you have sort of generic creature upgrades. So if you want to make a goblin, but he's aquatic, you can quickly look at that and see what it is. But if you look at a goblin, he's actually a phasing goblin, right? Or he's a ghost goblin or an undead goblin. Well, this is a goblin, but he's a stone construct. So you can take a standard stat block and give it these generic upgrades. So it's a great, and this is just on the, I mean, this is, 200, this is 336 pages. This is just literally inside cover of the book. And you get his thanks page, his table of contents, uh, and the table of contents. And you'll see that it's broken up into really, really cool categories. So you have, uh, the first section is people, the first chapter is people. And so you have adventurers, barbarians, cultists, knights, mercenaries, etc. Then you get dungeon creatures, you know, the, the, sort of the typical thing you find in a standard D&D dungeon. Giant spiders, goblins, liches, mimics, monstrous vermins, mummies, etc. Then you've got dragons, then thinking beasts, then heraldic beasts, primeval beasts, elemental beasts, divine beasts, dark and malign creatures. A wizard did it, <laughs> right? Uh, things like mutants or mind eaters, golems, eye tyrants, shivered beasts. Springs, creatures, summer creatures, fall creatures, winter creatures. 
hostile forests, hot plains, mysterious mountains, stormy seas, strange water, sci-fi creatures. And then at the end, he has generic entries. Uh, a generic village map, a generic, these are maps basically. So a generic village map and, and some information about it, a generic inn map and information about it, etc. And he goes down the whole list. World maps, cult layers, castles, wizard towers. Really, really cool, uh, easy to reference. And of course in the PDF, it's all um, clickable. These are hyperlinked, so you can go directly to it. You open up the table of context, you click right on where you need to go. It's a very, very well-formatted book. And then there are some useful sidebars that he gives you information on as well. There's an introduction to how to use this book, what it's for, and some jargon if you're not terribly familiar with a D20, a D20, or an OSR system. You might need some of, those, some of that jargon. How to read monster statistics and what's not included, uh, and what the effects that he talks about are, um, and, and you know ways to think about each of them. Uh, random encounters and what to do with those, the theory behind them, how to use them better. Um, and then tactics, ways of making each of these creatures you know, more interesting and what they might do with their different, um, you know, why they do what they do basically. <laughs> what they might, uh, what, what uh, regular creatures might do and why they might fight uh, to the death or where they might fight just to, to wound or, or whatever it might be. Um, and then it's about action economy. And then, and then this idea of what is a monster. I think that's really, really cool. Um, types of monsters, right? There's monsters of warning, monsters of unease, monsters of explanation, monsters of translation, monsters of allegory, and monsters of exaggeration. Now, these are just from our own world, right? What do, where do we get these different monsters that we've talked about? There's monsters of warning, right? Things like gob, goblins and lamia, which are warnings to children. Don't uh, go out at night, child, or you'll be eaten. Right? That's the idea behind the goblin or the lamia. It's a warning to children not to do it. So that's why the, that's where that monster came from, and why we still have it in our cultural you know lingo today. Monsters of unease, right? So what is the culture fear? What is it ashamed to desire? What defect in the world requires correction? So these are monsters that are um, our sort of cultural um, baggage, right? We put into these these particularizations of that culture. Base. Monsters of explanation, things like bog lights, right? What are those strange lights in the bog? Why are trees shredded by the wind? Why do drowned corpses look like that? Explanation. Well, these are obviously this kind of monster. Monsters of translation, right? These are really, really funny. Um, creatures that were one normal thing, and then an obscure word became something new in a later collection. And so people started to, you know, over time, this is now a monster. But in the original, it was nothing like that. Monsters of allegory, right? Um... This temple is protected by a mighty guardian, has the head of the wisest creature, the body of the strongest creature, the wings of the swiftest creature. Human head, bull, uh, and uh, and a hawk. And so there you have a monster of allegory. It stands for more than what it physically looks like. And monsters of exaggeration. Right? A creature so deadly its venom is kills instantly. No, even its breath can kill. No, the sight of it kills. And so you have these sort of exaggerations that keep going, keep going. And so if you want to create your own monster, you can sort of think about it in one of these terms, right? This book has a lot of stuff like this, just little bits of information that you can, um, I don't know, ways to kickstart your own thinking about things. I think it's really, really cool. All right, so people um, and uh, the kinds of people that you might run into. There's people, random encounters, uh, cross-reference omens. So omens in this are basically uh, how do you see them coming? Um, and a cross-reference omen would be this uh, one of the creatures from this chapter combined with creatures from other chapters. Um, so you have giant snakes fighting cultists, pirates and adventurers, a harvest avatar and peasants, a giant crab fighting mercenaries, right? So, and then, then omens that would reference that mixed encounter. So that way the first time you roll it, maybe you hear it. Or if they, if they roll, you know, say you're doing a, D10, a D6 system and you have it on a five, um, you hear of an encounter nearby, but you don't actually have one unless you choose to go to it or something like that. Well, that would be the omen, right? You hear it nearby. Um, okay. Um, and then over here, you have the people random encounters, the omen for them, and then the combined omen for them, if there's multiple kinds of people from this chapter, where they find you, where they find you outdoors, minor creatures again. Then you have a generic ear... It, Village, excuse me, and it has a little information. It's just a Dyson Logos map, I believe, uh, as well as the generic in. These are both Dyson Logos maps, and uh, and you just look through it, and you get um, you know just a general uh, overview 
of what these two places might be. A great little, very easy, if you want to pull it into your adventure at a, you know, at a moment's notice, you've got this. But then over here on the right, you've got the adventurers. Uh, this is a kind of creature you might run into, right? So um, you're going into a dungeon. Here is a rival adventuring party, and you roll up a quick uh, adventuring party. And it tells you how to generate them, what they might look like, what they want, right? Well, then you have variations, um, what their vice is and what their goal is. So it makes them more interesting simply than just, hey, we're here and we're just a generic adventuring party that wants to fight you. Um, and then there, why are these adventurers here in this particular dungeon? And then you can roll a type. So this is a human... He's brawling. Or this is a half-dwarf who is a dark half-dwarf. It's probably the Dwergar or something like that, right? And so then you have this whole um, little table. And then there's D100 adventurers. So if you just want to really quickly roll up a party, you can have you can roll you know, a D100 four times or three times or five times or how many you want and read straight across. Or you can roll and mix and match. So you could read, either read this as Smith Ledger Domain, Ledger Domain, he wears a striped fur-lined coat. He's a mountaineer, and he has a silver hammer pike. That's a specialty tool. Or you could say uh, Smith M. Legermain has curly blonde hair. He's a linguist, and he has implanted brass knuckles. It's a really cool, quick generation of varied, um, uh, of varied adventurers. That's just this one entry in the book. Then you've got names, generic names. Um, and it tells you how to develop them. If it's angel kin, devil kin, dragon kin, giant kin, orc kin, additional human names by syllable, silly names, or you can just come up with these names here. It's a great little list of names with regions, settlements, halfling gnome, unusual names, landform suffixes, and then dwarf and elf. And then you have this generic world map, which is hilarious, right? It's a generic world map that fits almost any kind of generic fantasy world. You have the Marble Palace, the Ambitious Wizards, the Trade Ports, the Heroic Hamlet, Bridgetown, Castle Chivalry, the Bucolic Farms, Wild Hills, the Blasted Heath, the Cyclopean Ruins, Gothica, <laughs> the Meat Mouth. <laughs> it's really great. All right, so that was that was just generic. Now you have Barbarians and Feats of Strength, these Barbarians. The barbarian Nations just over the horizon, and these Barbarians want. Then you have D100 Barbarians, um, particular guys and their distinctions. You've got the cultists here and generic cult layers, the various methodologies, layers, cult names, purposes, robes, secret science remarks, rituals, requirements, trappings, the things that they worship and the, the things that that that's worship summons, the things they shout while attacking, minor artifacts, such as power, fable, the powers of their exalted leader. Right, Great little uh, thing there. Knights uh, with their titles, their names. Uh, they're inconvenient quests. <laughs> knights, particular knights of legend who have had famous quests and their eccentricities, conditions for a fair duel, their dishonorable secret and what they ride, and then heraldry generator for this particular knight. Here's a generic castle with its name, surroundings, aesthetic, current exits and twists, mercenaries. The D50 mercenary missions. You have merchants, D100 merchants, pilgrims, peasants, D100 peasants. Townsfolk and D100 townsfolk, wizards and generic wizard spells um, with their elements, the, their their spell books and how they're copied in their familiars, their school, their, their their pompous wizard titles, and then D100 wizards with particular magic items that they have, uh, particular areas of study, just excellent, 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 and a generic wizard's tower with encounters that you might have there. All right, and over here. Chapter two, you have dungeon creatures. And obviously there's tons of great art in this book too. Dungeon creatures, random dungeon encounters, giant spiders, goblins. I love the goblins. So the goblins are, these goblins are red, uh, like old bricks, fresh blood or scabs. They're warty like walking heaps of pebbles. They're spongy mashed potatoes mixed with glue. They're corpulent, wobbly, panting and sweating. So every goblin tribe is different or every goblin group is different. And each goblins have special abilities. So these ones are gravel mouth. They can digest anything. And these ones are stinking. They are sweat tarnishes silver and rusts iron. These ones are rubberized. They're immune to fall damage. These ones are impious, immune to divine effects. And these ones, what are these goblins doing? They are squabbling over 1d6 gold and small change. They're digging a tunnel. Where does it lead? Barely wide enough to crawl through. They're displaying remarkable competence, preparing defenses, patrolling, waiting. So uh, these goblins... 
if you may, if you use these tables, your goblins are going to be different than any other goblins, and they'll be different than all the other goblins in your world. They'll make your goblins more fun and interesting rather than just generic green-skinned, you know, cowards who come in coward bullies or something like that. Um, D100 particular goblins, and then goblin elite weapons, goblin super weapons, goblin mounts, and goblin traps. So you can make your goblins really, really fascinating, really, really interesting for low-level parties. You don't have to have boring low-level encounters with these goblins. More and more tables on this. Goblin trivia. <laughs> uh, goblin leadership methods. Desperate and steering goblin tricks. Where do goblins come from? Goblin fears, fear reactions, things goblins can bully, and goblin loot. And then, of course, you have the goblin war machine, which is basically it's like a mech <laughs> that they have built. All right, then you have liches. Pronouncements of doom, omens of side effects of a lich, inconvenient lairs, appearance fragments, names. Goals, example, liches, a whole bunch here. Phylacteries, and the form of the phylactery, where it is, and the only way to destroy it, and then a generic lich's lair. The lich goals and their current project. You have mimics, the disguise, the disguise flaw. So rather than say, roll an investigation check, or maybe they roll an investigation check, and you say, well, it's a wooden chest, but there are no stitch marks on the chest at all. Or there are, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rich tapestry, but there are no stitch marks. That would be a better thing. <laughs> Chests with stitch marks. Maybe there's a chest with stitch marks. And you're like, huh, why would there be stitch marks on it? So it's, been, it's like a fabric chest? Oh, it's probably an imperfect mimic. And what it really looks like when you, when you look at it with true sight or when you manage to um, bring it into its real form. And advice for paranoid paralysis or what to do with it. Monstrous vermin, and the kinds of uh, vermin form and what it does to you. Mummies. And then here you have a menu item, and the same thing over here with the mimic. What does it taste like to eat, and why you might eat it? Um, myconids, again, why you might eat them. And uh, these myconids are different than all the other myconids. Mushroom flavors, poison mushroom effects, fungal treasures, hallucinogenic mushroom effects. So this is great. For Mike, and it's oozes, orcs, skeletons, D100 skeletons with particular special descriptions, which might make them better uh, than regular generic skeletons. Continues on there. Dragons. Now, this is one of the best chapters in the book, in my view. Dragon random encounters, again, the same basic start. But you've got ancient dragons now. Their names, their titles, their additional titles, yet more titles, because, of course, dragons are old. They're going to gather up lots of titles in appearance fragments. You have ancient dragon forms, its mood, activity problems, and special attacks. Generic horde and what's in that horde, desolations, what's around the destruction of a dragon. The area that it rules is called a, dress, a desolation. That's awesome. Right? The desolation of smog from The Hobbit, which is that uh, where that comes from. And menu, why you might eat a dragon. And what it might do to you when you eat an ancient dragon. You have Draco spawn, which are kind of like uh, Draconians from Dragonlance, right? And, but also maybe Dragonborn, and they have special abilities here. Drakes, which are wingless dragons, and uh, what they might be able to do. Dragons, which are sort of scaleless, creepy, rotted dragons. Ethereal dragons, kobolds, and lots of great kobold traps, kobold neuroses. Cunning kobold tactics, kobold schemes, thingies, kobolds are different in this way or that way or other ways. Um, generic dragon lair. A pseudo dragon, a wyvern, young dragon. Great, and I think like the kinds of special breath attacks they have. Sword spray is my favorite. A 30 foot cone, 3d10 piercing damage, safe for half, creates 1d6 rusted iron sword. So it just sprays out swords somehow. That's really cool. Uh, and what you might, why you might eat them. Ill-advised horde protection plans, because you're young dragons, they're going to make mistakes. And then zombie dragons. Type and all that. So thinking beasts, you've got harpies, kappas, lamasus, lamias, manticores, medusas, minotaurs, nagas, peritons, and sphinxes, along with tons of riddles. Basilisks, cataplasses. Chimeras and cockatrices, gifts, griffins, and hydras. Owlbears, questing beast, strong toad, and worm. I'm not going to go through any more of this book. You get the idea. Um, I'm just going to jump ahead to the end because there you get um, 
sci-fi. So then you get to the generic vault of Vegemite indices. You have the the benevolent knowledge, right? Celestial index of benevolent knowledge. Where might you get information <laughs> about these particular creatures? Um, there's a little bit of uh, how to deal with air aerial combat. Um, here you have the pages on them and the hit dice for the creatures in the book. Index of monster utility. If you wanted, if you want detached advice, who might you seek? If you want principal advice, who might you seek? If you want uh, cynical advice, who might you seek? Creatures that are doing its own thing. Harvest their hunted creatures. Worth capturing creatures. Hirelings and specialists, accomplices, demands, mounts, familiars, mysterious patrons, dreaded overlords, unleashed creatures, vaguely directed creatures, trained when a then aimed, trained, minions, minions, steered, retainers, etc. So you get the idea of monsters of utility. Here's a generic mega dungeon. If you want to just have a quick uh, mega dungeon, you're going, to, you're going to put in all the details yourselves, but this is just the generic term for each of these floors. And an alphabetical list of all the monsters in the book. So I, uh, another book I can't recommend enough. Obviously, it's just a, an embarrassment of riches. So much information on each of these creatures. You can use these creatures. When you're gen generating your setting, you can use this book to help you create the kinds of creatures in the world. Or if you're doing something more generic, like 5e, um, and like Forgotten Realms, for example, you can make this particular creature that you're about to run into much more interesting than the average creature in the monster manual. So you can use this alongside another monster manual. Um, or you can have this kind of be your monster manual. Either way, this is a great book, and uh, I highly recommend it. All right, guys, I'll get back to the Strahd video series in a bit, but um, I thought I would make this. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you around.